very much, and uh, thanks very much for the hospitality and uh, having us all here. Um, I think the health sector here is fairly dominant, um, in that there are quite a few of us this morning, um, fortunately, but nonetheless there are those that aren't in that sector. So I'm going to go through, as I've been asked to, uh, climate change as it relates to health. And I'm going to try to do that in no more than 15 or 20 minutes, such that we've got 40 or 45 minutes for discussion. Yeah, good, right, we'll try. Um, so just in brief, th this is where I work, my clinical practice. This is, a, this is an intensive care patient who's got more holes in them than God uh, provided them with to start with. And around 35% of those patients will die and that's not just because I'm useless, that's just sort of a national, national average. Not just because. Not just because, no, I'm sure there are other elements too. Um, the feature about most of these patients is that while some of them are incredibly healthy and get hit by a truck or have some very random event which becomes life-threatening, the majority of these people um, have a chronic disease burden and that then a second hit comes in, as it's known in the medical jargon, and second hits are what causes you to collapse and die. And we heard eloquently yesterday about the fact that the planet is under some degree of chronic pressure. And I'm not going to go through all of those, but I'm going to take one minute to summarise. And that's just to put, to emphasise in these slides mm. the time scales, because in terms of human health and human biology and human ability to physiologically adapt to change, we, we've had a long time to uh, accustom ourselves to the environment in which we live. So if you look at hominid populations of the world coming out of Takana Basin, it took well over two million years for the, human, well, for the hominid population to reach a billion. And if you look at mitochondrial genetics, um, humans, as a, as a sort of humans as humans appeared around 150,000 years ago. So either way, whether you're going for two million or 150,000 years, um, it took that length of time to reach a billion. And we've been going up there for another 123 or so years to get another billion. And we've been stacking billions on the planet ever since. Currently it's a rate of around another billion every 12 years, such that we've now reached over 7 billion, and that's probably an underestimate um, for various reasons. And whilst world GDP has risen, GDP per capita has gone up because we're all, even the poorest people, are across an average becoming wealthier. And what that means is that world GDP in 1990 adjusted dollars has risen from 600 billion in 1800 to 4,000 billion to 61 trillion in 2010, with bank holdings last year estimated at 63.4 trillion. And this money, apart from quantitative easing, is underpinned by use of stuff. So if we look at simple stuff, use of fish, 17 kilograms per man, woman, and child on the planet now being consumed with stocks collapsing, grain production having to rise inexorably, World meat production, now 45 kilograms per man, woman, and child on the planet, and that's exceeding the rate at which the population is growing. That means that we have to use a lot more land. We're currently stripping out uh, some of the region of 20 football pitches a minute. And we're using a lot of water, which we heard yesterday, and that isn't sustainable. As we heard alluded to, a lot of this water comes from fossil aquifers, and once they're dried up, they're gone, and uh, there's one that feeds in, supplements that draining from the high river. When that goes, which it may well in the next 20 years, that's the rise production of 120 million people gone. And with that, we're getting this mass extinction event, which we heard. These are the UNEP quotes. So that's the chronic pressure, without anything at all to do with climate change. And all of those things, food security, water security, and biodiversity and available fish stocks, in, will impact on human health. <coughs> But on top of that, we've now got this acute kick from climate change. And that rate is accelerating. We've heard these are the data from the year before last, what we were burning every second. And as we heard, this is going up, went up by 5.9% in terms of CO2 emissions in uh, 2010, 56 the year before, and an average of 3.1 for every year of the previous decade. And that's getting us hotter in a time scale that's very short. Right. Why does that matter to human health? One of the problems about this um, is the fact that, uh, for, certainly for the IPCC reports, um, we're only able to quote peer-reviewed, scientifically proven data. 
And in the medical world, sometimes that's not terribly helpful. So the simple analogy, which many of you will have heard before, that no one's ever done a randomized uh, trial of jumping out of airplanes without a parachute, because it's fairly obvious what would happen. But you wouldn't be able to say that jumping out of airplanes without parachutes was certain to lead to death in nearly every case in an IPCC report, because no one's done the randomized trial. So a lot of what we've got to start thinking about is what I would call the bleed and obvious. And that's really why uh, the UCL Lancet Commission report a few years ago now described climate change as the greatest threat to human health of the 21st century. It's not the only threat, it's a direct threat and it's a force multiplier. And that's why that statement was there. So I'm going to run you through quickly the, the, the range of ways in which climate change interacts with health. Now the first is that biological, uh, so um, bacterial doubling rates shorten as temperatures go up by and large. By and large, bacteria divide more quickly as it gets hotter. So if you look at rates of salmonella, for instance, as temperatures go up, salmonella rates go up, which is why you have a dodgy tummy more commonly in Egypt than in North London. Um, if you've got bacterial contamination, that will replicate much more quickly in a warm environment. Now you can get over that with having good fridges and good hygiene. Parasitic modelling is much more difficult, um, and malaria is probably the worst of those examples, but this is just to say that as rainfall patterns change and temperatures rise, the capacity for malarial transmission increases. So this is fuzzy logic uh, modelling, where red is a certainty of malarial transmission. And this was then done, this was done in 2002, on mid-range estimates. These estimates are now way at the bottom end, way off the lowest end now. Um, but at the time, they were considered mid-range estimates of risk. But nonetheless, if you look at even at these now completely unfeasibly, ridiculously low elements of risk, this is what happens by 2050. And we see the same applying to large numbers of other things. With malaria, it's not just about the activity of the mosquito. <coughs> It's the fact that the doubling time of the malarial parasite inside the mosquito shortens. So as temperatures rise, replication rates increase, and you get more parasites. The same applies to dengue. Uh, dengue or breakbone fever is a, is a life-threatening disease. Uh, and for the, if you've ever seen a patient with it, it's really very, very unpleasant indeed. Um, and it's very incapacitating even for people who recover. Increased temperatures shorten the viral incubation period in the mosquito. They shorten the breeding cycle of the mosquito. They increase the activity of mosquito feeding, and they increase malaria, uh, sorry, uh, for, uh, transmission of the dengue virus itself. And this is one of many. Uh, schistosomiasis, um, or bilharzia, is a great concern, particularly the Chinese and the Yangtze and, and the Yellow River at the moment, as that's spreading further north. That's a snail-borne vector. Temperatures kill, rising temperatures kill, and you can see that even in UK. Um, we're homeothermic, we're adjusted to cope with pretty narrow ranges of temperature, and we extend those boundaries by air conditioning or heating or wearing different sorts of clothing. But there are limits to our adaptability, and even in the UK, as temperatures go up, mortality also rises. And you can see that in other countries as well. This is just a nice graph running through just a few years looking at the seasonal changes in Delhi of death rates rising and falling by season as temperatures rise and fall. <coughs> and on top of that, of course, we have the heat waves themselves with extremes of temperature, which Phil was referring to yesterday, that those are becoming increasingly common. This is the 2003 anomaly, which led to somewhere between 35 and 75,000 extra deaths in a two-week period. And while some of those deaths are culling those that are shortly about to die anyway, um, these sorts of extreme temperatures do carry away people that otherwise wouldn't survive. So there are, um, it's not just a question of uh, the reaper arriving a little bit early for some. Temperatures impact on ground level pollution. So this is just photochemistry essentially. Ozone levels go up in urban environments as temperatures rise. And ground level ozone, this isn't uh, stratospheric ozone, this is low level <coughs> ozone, which is very harmful to humans. It's particularly harmful to the respiratory epithelium. And there are changes in peak airflow, so that's 
asthma to you and I, within about 90 seconds of exposure to increased ozone concentration. So if your child is walking to school on a warm day when these ozone levels are higher, they're much more likely to have restriction in their respiratory capacity. And there are increasing data to suggest that chronic exposure to these high levels are produce long-lasting damage that may not be recoverable. And in terms of respiratory disease, aeroallergens change. So we're having an earlier onset of a pollen season which lasts a great deal longer. The pollen production is greater. And interestingly, as species change, um, our human biology is adapted in terms of immune response to the environments in which we find ourselves. And that has quite significant effects on long-term health. So, for instance, if you move countries of residence after the age of 30, your mortality rate goes up in a way that it doesn't if you move as a child. And that's partly because you're adapted to the microbiological and allergenic environment in which you find yourself. We're seeing uh, increasing amounts of rapeseed, particularly pollen, but interestingly, ragweed pollen, which is becoming a major issue, very highly allergenic. So respiratory uh, disease is getting worse. Extreme weather events are important. We feel ourselves insulated in the Western world because we've got big brick buildings. But we know, and in fact, I think the report came out, uh, at least the advance report was out this morning. I don't know if it, it, I think the official report is now, is now available. It should be available in hard copy. Yeah, and I, I got an email this morning saying that, they, that, that it was now out, I think. So the, the um, certainly extreme weather events come there. Uh, Phil will know better than I, and I know there's an enormous debate about whether uh, changes in tornado frequency have anything to do with climate changes. I don't understand that, and I'm not, done, I'm not a climate physicist, but... That's just reporting. That's just better reporting rates. Do you think it is? Yeah. But certainly, whether or not one looks at extreme weather events around the world being related, certainly the uh, Swiss Re and Lloyds and others uh, are convinced that they are seeing increases in extreme weather events, which they will describe to that. And again, Phil will be able to comment in much, with much greater, uh, better fidelity than I. Um, but certainly Jim Hansen and others will describe changes in extreme weather events to, uh, to climate changing at the moment. And the IPCC report is suggesting certainly that we will have a likely increase in wind speed for tropical cyclones, that there's high confidence of increase in landslides, gradual retreat, and permafrost loss. And whether or not one can ascribe individual events like um, a fifth of Pakistan going underwater, if we are going to get further extreme weather events, at least this is the sort of, uh, gives us an idea of uh, what might be coming. And these are, the point I would make about these sorts of events in terms of the mitigation or adaptation argument is that I can't see how nation states can build capacity to adapt to um, the vast variety and lack of predictability of events of this sort and their scale. Um, and one could think of the same about, uh, about heat. So this is heavy precipitation, likely to increase Coastal flooding likely to increase partly because of the extreme weather events and also rises in sea levels, and that's very likely to continue to rise. These are just direct quotes from IPCC. And here are the sea level rise data. So habitation is under threat. It's, it's more under threat if you're in low-lying areas or in poorer countries or where your buildings are less structurally stable. But we've already heard that um, food stock is threatened quite independently of climate change. And if we look at this temperature anomaly in June 2010, that was associated with um, substantial effects in Southeast Asia, but also in Russia particularly. <coughs> and um, grain crops certainly failed in Russia. In Kazakhstan, I met with one of their politicians last year, and of course they've gone from being, a, I haven't been aware of really the scale of Kazakhstan grain export, which essentially ceased. And that was one of the factors in driving up the price of grain. There were other factors too, and there was speculation involved, but nonetheless, when grain crops fail, prices rise. And that sort of thing can interact for the reasons which we need to go into now, Nick Stern's report suggesting that 
climate change on a date of this century would have this sort of impact. Of course, he's now redacted this to say that it would be vastly worse than this. This was a very underestimate of the level of, uh, of threat posed by climate change economically. Now, this is one of these IPCC reports that says, you know, there may be some more migration. I think for any of us who've worked in health nationally or in public health or internationally would say that this is just an absolute given. That when you get changes in disease patterns, increased poverty, uh, lack of water resources, flooding and drought, um, crop failure and starvation, that you will get political instability and you'll move. And if populations move into areas that are similarly stressed, that leads to conflict. And as early as 2003, the Pentagon were coming out with these. We heard yesterday, I think it was Rob that was talking about, uh, maybe it was maybe Bob talking about being on the CIA panel. Um, the CIA have released a large number of statements in recent years, so of Homeland Security, raising these issues very directly. And I love this particular phrase here, the result could be a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. Um, they got that bit right. This really is about a large-scale death. You can look up the literature if, if you wish. I wrote an editorial with um, Sir Ian Gilmore, uh, who was then president of the Royal College of Physicians, and with Admiral Neil Morissetti, who directs climate and energy security for the Ministry of Defence, um, and Admiral Lionel Jarvis uh, last year for the British Medical Journal, which has summarised uh, this position. But there are recognised threats to human, human security and hence to survival which are engaging the military in a very major way. There have been six meetings at the Royal United Services Institute on this very subject, and the military are taking it very seriously. So that's what we've got. We've had the direct deaths from heat uh, and direct injury from storms and so forth, loss of habitation, pollution effects, air allergens, food-related illness and also disease vectors, uh, crop failure, flooding, drought, economic collapse, mass migration, and conflict. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that this is really desperately detrimental to human health because across the world we always like to think that people are dying of high-tech type diseases, but actually mostly people die from poverty, starvation, and war. It's the four horsemen of apocalypse that have always been there, plague, pestilence, famine, and war. But on top of that, of course, is the ecosystem collapse. This paper was substantially criticised for various reasons, and um, I, again, I'm not uh, an expert in ecosystem, um, but I do work with Paul Pierce Kelly and others at the Institute of Zoology, who are absolutely certain that climate change will impact very directly on species survival, <coughs> working synergistically with the threats we spoke of earlier to cause ecosystem collapse. And at the top of any biological pyramid, which essentially we are, um, if one knocks that pyramid down, we're under threat. And we cannot think that we're isolated from our natural world and that we can allow this sort of situation to proceed. So finally, and then that should be about 15 minutes, I hope, hopefully not a great deal more. The question is where we're heading at the moment. Well, we heard that yesterday. Those were the data currently from the A1B curves that we're really essentially making the point that we are at the worst end of business as usual. That's where A1B takes us by century end, and that's the A1F. And neither of these are compatible with two degrees. And we heard yesterday that we're locked in pretty much to 450 um, by 2017, which I think most people would say is, um, is the case. I really object to this two degrees business. I know why it's there. It was chosen pragmatically, as far as I could see, because it was something that people felt we could attain. So it was a target to shoot for because it was one we might be able to hit. But to suggest that two degrees is in some way safe when you see the impact we've had with perhaps 0.78 or 0.8 degrees, um, to my mind, is a nonsense. And I don't see any logic. I've never been able to find anything that says that two degrees is some safe threshold. And I like this quote particularly. Um, this was from... Philosophical, uh, philosophical transactions, that more appropriate represents the threshold between dangerous and extremely dangerous climate change. I'm not even sure it represents a threshold. I just think it's bloody dangerous. 
this is from the same paper. Now I can't comment at all on the second part about stability at all, Phil will probably be able to comment on that. But every, every one of us in this room that works in international or public health would concur with the first bit. This sort of rate, rate of change and scale of change will be disruptive to a point where I don't think organized human communities will be able to manage. Now you can argue this, this was HSBC's 2009 report, which was, uh, I think, senior author by Nick Robbins, who knows his beans. I don't know where we're heading. I don't think we're heading for two degrees, and I think anything beyond that is dangerous, and I think the more, the higher you go, the more dangerous it becomes to human health. But if we are heading for sixes and sevens, or fours and fives, um, in this sort of time scale, we're in a lot of trouble. So in terms of where we are, I think we really are running full tilt towards the precipice. And as I said to Robin the other day, I'm not sure there's a parachute once we've gone over the edge. And uh, whilst building in some capacity for adaptation is clearly going to be important for the reasons we discussed, we're locked into two degrees anyway. Um, if we use that as some substitute for taking really aggressive action, we're going to go over the edge. And as I say, there won't be a parachute. So that's where I'm going to stop. Um, question is, in my last three slides, is there a cure? Well, the health message, for those of you not familiar with this, is something that Ian uh, was, was co-authored some of these reports, uh, to which I refer. But there are things that the health sector can do. So if we just look at UK road transport emissions, 22% of UK greenhouse gas emissions, average speeds are woeful. And the reason they're woeful is that most people are not zooming around motorways at 3 o'clock in the morning. They're clunking their way through cities um, in rush hours. And that's grindingly slow. And the fact that nearly six out of 10 road journeys are less than two miles. Now, I appreciate that if you're disabled or 94 years old, bilateral amputee with a spinal injury, that's going to be pretty hard to go the two miles. But for most of us, two miles is not a great distance to travel. And if we wish to, we could adjust the way we travel to work or that we traveled to school, or that we went to our shops. And it needn't involve motorized transport. Because exercise is massively underestimated as a benefit. So if we were to get, and I'm looking at Mary here, if we have proper policy in government about exercise, it makes enormous differences. And everyone you ask in the general public about exercise, say, oh yeah, you get less heart attacks. You get less depression. Multi moderate depressive illness is massively reduced by regular exercise. And for most of the data that we can interpolate in terms of therapy, it's probably somewhere between four and seven times more effective than the standard pharmacological agent a drug company would prescribe. Um, there have been randomized trials, believe it or not, even blinded trials where people are taken to gyms and put through programs of what they perceive to be exercise, so waving a few weights around wearing lycra or being made to do some <laughs> proper aerobic exercise. And there are substantial and proven differences in concentration, mental capacity, mental health, positivity of attitude, and so forth. We know that exercise, along with dietary change, which we'll come to shortly, um, is protective against Alzheimer's disease. Never, never completely, but it substantially reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease. It lowers blood pressures. It reduces stroke rates. It lowers heart attack rates. Interestingly, it is associated very strongly with the reduction rate of breast cancer, which now one in seven women in their lifetime in Britain will be affected by, and bowel cancer, which is the second biggest killer of men in this country. To the extent that Macmillan uh, have launched a very large campaign last year, which we've been assisting with, saying that there is no better prevention for cancer, at some things like cigarette smoking for specifics, than exercise. And the data are pretty strong that exercise, once one's had cancer, is protective against recurrence. Now, it's hard to divorce changes in exercise from changes in diet, but somewhere along the way, people who exercise regularly probably have a 25% lower recurrence rate of bowel cancer after treatment. We know it prevents osteoporosis, and we know it prevents obesity and with that diabetes. 
So changes in policy, and I think I'd like Ian perhaps to pick up on this afterwards, this isn't a question of beasting people to spend 55 quid a month for gym membership. It's about changing the way our societies work, such that, as Ian to steal Ian's quote, Ian says that you know, 50 years ago there was no such thing as exercise, there was movement. We know that changes in red meat consumption, as Ian was alluded to yesterday, trans fat and red meat lowers bowel cancer rates, coronary vascular rates, probably as well improves mental health. We know that reducing road use, burning coal, improves air quality, which reduces cancer rates in the lung and respiratory disease. Either way, if you model just a few of those, as this Healthcare Without Harm and Heal report showed, huge fiscal savings um, by going to lower greenhouse gas. This is enormous. Uh, Andy Haynes led this report, which Ian was an author on, looking at the public health benefits and fiscal benefits of going low carbon, and they are enormous. And uh, since we're in a Chatham House sort of environment, uh, Nick Stern is very excited by this, and we're working with Andy Haynes and others, and hopefully Ian will be joining us, um, to work up a project that Robin here first proposed, and that was to really model the health economics in enormous detail. So we're trying to raise the money to model not just the impact on Alzheimer's, depression, osteoporosis, all of those diseases, and the economic cost to treating them, but the economic value of me not being in a hospital bed for 15 months, having chemotherapy and surgery, but continuing to work. So what's the benefit of that to UK PLC in terms of our GDP? And it will have to be offset with the downside to the country's coffers, i.e. I get to 65 or 68 and claim a pension, rather than dying young. So one would have to offset those two things. But we certainly feel that that's worthy of modelling properly because it would play well to recidivists who may not believe in climate change. It might just give them a reason to want to engage quite separately from the climate issues. And as Mark Walton says, these sorts of messages offer a very convenient truth about public health. Finally, just to make the point, whatever we're going to do, though, it's going to have to be absolutely enormous um, currently, or actually like two years ago, every dollar of world GDP was associated with 768 grams CO2 release, and it needs to go down to six if we're going to be sustainable. And this isn't just therefore a question of changing the light bulbs. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to I'll put a few questions up which we might want to start with, but we should have plenty of time to discuss. Um, are these medical messages of threat valuable? Are the medical messages of co benefit valuable? And if so, how should they be deployed in a way that isn't just incremental, but is transformative? And I really, since we've got a diverse, diverse group of well-educated and informed people, I'd like to think a little bit about really what we have to do, because the, when this was discussed yesterday, and I think it was Robin that put it out there saying, you know, what do we need to do? And the answer was, well, basically change the entire world economy, change the taxation system, change public health, change public awareness. Sure, <laughs> what are we going to do? We don't have very long to get this sorted out. We're going to have to come up with something um, aggressive of a time scale and, uh, and an efficacy um, which is realistic to what's required. And certainly in health, that's always our bottom line. We have to take whatever action is required now to get that patient to live. We can't do it the other way around by saying, well, we're resource constrained, therefore we'll just see how things run on for a year because our patients will all be dead if we did that. Right, there we are. Time for me to stop and time for you to start talking, I hope. Thank you.